Okay, so welcome to the final workshop of the Sustainable Earth event. With the Action Workshops, we are really keen to provide a space for some longer, more detailed exploration, particularly around what we can do, what we can act um, on around the climate emergency. And this was for everyone. So we've got workshops designed for large and small businesses, for social enterprises, for community groups, and also for us all as individuals. Hence, we were really pleased when Justin from Plymouth Energy Community agreed to do a workshop on how to retrofit your home to support the race to net zero. This is one of the key ways to reduce your personal emissions. So please give a warm welcome to Justin Bear from the Plymouth Energy Community. Oh, I've just been told uh, that we've got a slight technical issue in that Justin's just disappeared. <laughs> so um, apologies, everyone. Um, he, he's obviously just lost his, his internet connection or his Wi-Fi, so he's just disappeared from um, our backstage here. Um, and I can see that he's coming back uh, very shortly. So um, I'll just, I'll let Justin gather himself for two minutes as I'm sure his heart rate is up there at the moment. Um, and uh, as well as Kaylee, our technical person here. So um, if I can uh, hand over to Justin now to take you through the workshop. Thanks ever so much, Justin. Hi there, I apologize for that. I just got a network error message just as it turned to three o'clock, which is always calming. Um, so I'm here to talk about retrofit. Um, thank you very much for coming along. Um, we're going to cover a bit of looking at individual level, the, the house, um, but also a bit of looking at the national level. What's, what's the picture in terms of what we need to do as a country to get ready for this? Um, and uh, yeah, try and run through that and hopefully that will be useful to everybody coming. Um, my name is Justin Bear. I work for Plymouth Energy Community. I'm a project manager there. And that means my job really is to work out what projects we need that, that do, do what our community needs. So that's quite often that's quite innovative projects, working out what, what we can do that kind of solves a problem that isn't being solved at the moment. Um, finding the funding for that and then delivering those projects. Um, and it's a very, very good job, <laughs> I'd like to say. Really good. So. Before we move on to talking about retrofit, I just want to talk for a moment about Plymouth Energy Community. I'm aware there may be some people here that haven't been aware of Plymouth Energy Community to date. Plymouth Energy Community's mission, and I'm not going to read off too many slides here, but this is one where I think it's worth doing, is to bring local people and organisations together to tackle fuel poverty and the climate crisis, to increase local ownership and influence over local energy solutions, to improve community confidence to engage in the net zero carbon transition and to enable people to heat and power their homes affordably we're part of a network of community energy organizations up and down the country and their role in general and, and different community energy organizations have slightly different ways of doing that but really is to catalyze that transition really within their own communities uh, to use their expertise and their knowledge of their community to to try and make sure that people in, in their area are benefiting the most from um, the, the transition to lead that. In terms of how we do that in Plymouth, there's two big areas of our work really and one of those is asset ownership uh, and what you're seeing there is a um, solar farm in Ernestettle um, which we own so we've raised about 2.5 million pounds worth of community shares um, and used that to install somewhere between eight and seven and eight million pounds worth of solar energy across the city on 32 different community roofs um, and also in that, that solar farm. There'll be more solar coming on board uh, in the future as well, but we've branched out a little bit now and, and we've also set up a, an organisation that's uh, going to be house building in the city. So we've looked at that housing market and said 
that's just not meeting the needs of what we need at the moment. We're not building homes that have got low enough carbon standards. We're not building homes that are affordable for people. Um, so we need to start looking at some of the innovative models that will allow us to do that. Um, and we've got a site um, in Plymouth currently that's just gone in for planning permission um, to, to look at that. So that asset ownership model grows and increases and, and that provides benefits both because what we install is good, whether that's low carbon housing or solar panels, it also provides benefits to those that have invested, people from our community who've invested in those projects. But those projects also develop, generate some form of profit or surplus and that goes straight back into the local community. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's usually through fuel poverty projects and, and the work that we do there. So it's got a number of different ways that those projects and those assets benefit our community. The second way we work is to actually engage directly with the problems that we see within our communities. So this is one of our advisors, Kathy, um, and we've got a team of about seven advisors that work uh, mostly around fuel poverty and improving that within the city. And they do amazing work. Uh, so about for so one day of time for one of our advisors generally de generates. 600 pounds worth of more than 600 pounds worth of benefit to residents in the city uh, within a year of that advice so they're worth about 600 pounds a day to the city which is um, amazing really uh, and there's seven of them working like that full time and their work is really broad uh, kathy was talking just the other day about a visit that she did where she was there to talk about fuel debt and did help somebody with fuel debt um, but while she was there she also managed to get him access to benefits that, that were worth £4,000 a year to him, helped him out with a green bin um, issue, which again, and, and a whole series of other issues that once you walk into somebody's home, you find, and if you can help them with that, then it leaves them much more independent um, to, to work forward from there. We're also, and this is where the topic of this uh, comes in, looking at the retrofit challenge. And we're already looking at that with a, a view to fuel poverty, but we're also looking to launch services in that space within the next year or so, or a year, hopefully, a year to, to support householders who, who want to invest in retrofitting their homes. Um, and that's really important. Having a bit of a delay on slides here a moment, bear with me. There we are. So, that's an idea of our impact um, in a year. This is this is what we achieved um, in a number of different areas. So some working with households, some savings for, for organisations and schools. So that's Plymouth Energy Community. And I'm going to talk about retrofit today. And these are the questions that I want to ask and or answer really around retrofit, which in my mind are the important ones. And that is, what does domestic retrofit we need look like? Why is it urgently needed? How do we get there? And then just spend a little bit of time saying about how Plymouth Energy Community are driving this change and about what, what I can do, what you can do. Before we embark on that, I just want to do a couple of polls um, just to learn a little bit more about why you're here and, and who we've got in the room. So the first of those is, what would you like to learn most about this session? The local picture, how I should retrofit my home, or the national picture, what is the challenge and how do we meet that? Or neither, if neither of those is what you want to learn here. I'm gonna launch a poll now and just take a couple of moments to get some votes on that. Okay, so there's a very strong favouring of the local picture and, and very directly, how should you retrofit your home? Okay, there's plenty in here about that. There is some in, in about the national picture as well, but I will um, try to keep a bit more time for the local picture um, to make sure we're getting people what they want. Um, second one I just want to have a, a look at is, what actions have you taken to reduce your energy usage? And the options there are none, some behavioural changes, turning down heating controls, turning off lights, that sort of thing. 
minor investments or grant funded works or significant investment in energy efficiency or renewable energy. You've put in a fair amount of your own money and you're really trying to cut um, energy from your house. So again, if you could just respond to that one for me. So we've got a good mix here. Um, lots of people who haven't have looked at those behavioural changes, haven't gone on to to make any investments or uh, received any works in their home. But actually, you know, a number of people, a few pe people who've who've made some changes, and some people who've who've really um, had a good go at it, have really put some some resources into it, which is is good to see a good mix there. So, there's a couple of other polls that I'll come back to later, but. Um, Let's move on. So we're going to look at what does the domestic retrofit we need look like? And the first place to start there is to look at actually where is energy being used in the home? Where, where is it we really need to focus on cutting? And, and that chart on the left really demonstrates that well, I think. So I mean, the first thing that's got to stand out to you on, on there is that space heating and hot water are the vast majority of that chart, um, 84%. Um, there are ways of cutting electricity usage from electronics and appliances um, and from, from cooking more efficiently, and, and they're all certainly worth doing. And, and it's certainly true to say that cutting electricity usage has a better financial advantage because it costs more for electric than it does for gas. But if you're looking at trying to cut energy usage as a whole and for environmental purposes, you have to look at that 84% chunk and say, that's really where we need to focus. And the chart on the right there gives an idea of an uninsulated home. So it's very important when you look at charts like this, that they're often not explained in that way. This is a home that hasn't had wall insulation, hasn't had loft insulation, hasn't had double glazing. Where is energy lost from that home? And, and the, most of that is the walls, 35% from the walls, 25% from the loft. 15% from the floor, just 10% from the windows, and 15% from drafts, which is higher than I think some people may think, the 15% from drafts, I always think. So you're keeping a kind of general broad approach, you really want to focus it in this way. Energy conservation is your first step. That's free essentially or very very low cost to do um, and can have quite a significant impact energy efficiency cutting the the need for energy with insulation or other measures like that and and then end with the renewable energy um, there are issues if you start trying to do it the other way around one of the issues may well be the size of the renewable energy system that you decide to install may be far too large once you've done the other measures to your home um, and may not work very efficiently because it's too large. So you, you want to do it this way around. What does that mean? Energy conservation measures. Um, heating controls are a really obvious one. Certainly if you're living in a house without some um, good quality heating controls that you know how to use and, and are using, um, that's a really, really obvious step. Um, and they don't cost all that much considering how much they save um, and they're, they're certainly worth investing in so that might look like um, a, a good thermostat that you can you can control quite well you can set different temperatures at different times of the day and that you know how to use it and, and are happy to engage with it if it's one that's a real headache to, to use and get rid of it and get a new one because it's not helping you um, Behaviour changes, I think they're all reasonably well communicated. I don't think I need to speak about only filling kettles as much as you need them and that sort of thing. But there are some aspects of that. Like if you've got appliances that remain on and, and on standby, you know, a whole cluster of them because you can't get to the socket, it really doesn't cost very much to get a, a smart plug or a, a plug that can be turned off much more easily. So um, there are some, uh, some options there that are worth thinking about. I've included better ventilation in there. The number of householders who 
you talk to and, and say, I keep a window open all winter in my bedroom at night because I like the fresh air or I like uh, it to be colder. A window open overnight in a bedroom of a house that is heated loses enough energy to drive a small car 55 miles. So if you try and transfer the energy loss through that window <clears throat> into another way we use energy, it would be to drive a small car 55 miles. There's an enormous amount of energy in heat. And by leaving those windows open all night, um, of course, you know, if, if you want your, your room to be colder, if you want fresher air in your room, that's something you should be able to have. But what I'd encourage people to do is, is look at a different way of doing that than maybe keeping a window open. That might be putting trickle vents in windows. It would provide a little bit less ventilation, better ventilation in the bathroom, or you know, turning down heating in that room um, so it's colder. And you know, I don't want to <laughs> tell people how to, to do things. And it, these may not work in all cases, but there are different ways of looking at things. And just being aware of how much energy is lost through that window by it being open overnight, I think is an important thing. There are other things like water saving and, and maintenance, which, which again, are, are quite easy to, to fit. But a wet wall, if you've got guttering that's overflowing, a wet wall releases a lot more heat than a dry wall. And a boiler that's not well serviced may well not be working efficiently. So those energy conservation things, um, they are important. When it comes to energy efficiency, there are some real no regrets measures here. In fact, it's worth regretting that you haven't done it already if you haven't for some of these. LED lighting, um, certainly uh, any of the early issues with them being a bit kind of harsh or difficult of, you know, you can buy really nice bulbs now that give, you know, very similar sort of lights as the old um, filament bulbs. Loft insulation um, and a note on that is, I, I don't, there's a lot of advertisement around about spray foam loft insulation at the moment. There are some circumstances where that might be a reason why that's worthwhile, but for the most part, it's a much more expensive and not particularly better form of insulating a loft than laying a significant amount of insulation of the mineral wool on the floor of the loft, the traditional way we've always done it. Um, and you can build platforms that sit above that loft insulation if you need storage, um, which is probably still cheaper than spray foam insulating your loft. There are some complications from spray foam insulation that, um, that can happen, like with any type of insulation, but they're potentially more likely to, and you're less likely to see them with spray foam insulation. So, um, Cavity wall insulation, and I would caveat that with if it's being done by an installer that's having a good survey of your house and knows what they're doing. Draft proofing um, is, a, is a huge one, and, and that's not just looking at windows and doors. That's not just looking at kind of a little bit, little bit of strips on there. There are so many places we lose warm air in our house, up through loft hatches, through floorboards, through chimneys. Chimneys is a, is a huge loss of, of air um, because all hot air wants to rise up. So it, it will quite happily keep running out of your chimney. So there are devices that stop all of this um, and they, they aren't terribly expensive. You'll probably get your money back in, you know, two, three years, something like that. There are other measures that take, I would advise you to take your time to plan. Um, and that's because they are an investment and they're worth thinking about. And, and some of the reasons why they're worth thinking about, we're gonna go over in a moment. Um, so those would be floor insulation, solid wall insulation, room and roof insulation, heat recovery ventilation. The form of ventilation where you, uh, usually the whole house system doesn't have to be, um, where it extracts warm air, from, warm damp air from your house. Um, but when it brings in fresh air from outside, it, it heats that up using the warm air from your house. And the obvious measures in terms of renewable energy, uh, heat pumps are being talked about an awful lot at the moment and are a key part of this uh, decarbonisation of housing. Solar PV, solar thermal, and it's worth saying in their communal heating system, because although many people may turn to an air source heat pump, um, ground source heat pumps are prohibit prohibitively expensive, um, but are not necessarily quite so expensive 
um, if you can connect them up with a communal system and share them between several homes. So an ASOS heat pump is would look like a kind of air conditioning unit on the side of a house. It's what they look like, but um, they provide uh, heat by by harvesting heat from the air, really, without going into details of how they work. Um, but there's an option there which has a borehole that goes underground or a trench underground, so it takes heat from the ground um, outside your house. And all these systems will start to come in. Obviously, heat pumps will be getting increasing amounts of support um, as, a, as a kind of way of transitioning away from gas central heating. But I think communal heating systems will also become uh, a much more important part of the picture. As a very quick note here, and I'm not going to go into details in this slide, but briefly what it says here is you know, in terms of new build homes, and this is about new build, I know we're talking about retrofit, but it is, is relevant. If we go to higher fabric fabric standards, you know, this is a if we start building them all to passive house standards, but putting gas boilers in them, um, we do lose a significant amount of the carbon emissions, but by no means all of them. And if you want to move it down to kind of very low levels of carbon emissions, it has to be heat pumps. Um, and and so that hierarchy I say there, the, actually, we should do the energy efficiency first. That's very true. I'm not saying that's not true, but we can't just end on the energy efficiency measures we do have to do the renewables as well hopefully that kind of starts to give the picture of actually the scale of the challenge here we, we do need to drastically cut the amount our homes use of to heat to stay warm how much it takes them to stay warm you also have to change how we're doing that I quickly run through some of the issues of how we've done this in the past and and some of you i've seen already seen in the chat that there's a number of people who've had um experience of trying to retrofit their homes and have found that um difficult over time really our approach to this in the country to date has been to take the low-hanging fruit the loft insulation the cavity wall insulation somebody can turn up in a day get it done it doesn't take very long it's not very disruptive it doesn't cost very much it does save a fair amount of energy and that's a perfectly reasonable way to tackle low-hanging fruit. As that sort of approach has been moved into more complicated measures, solid wall insulation, and actually in many cases cavity wall insulation where it can be more complicated, um, you can start to have problems. And just to take a moment to kind of explore that and be aware of that. A bit of delay on slides again, bear with me. Here we go. Coal bridging and air loss. So I would invite you to look at this pie chart on the right hand side first here. This is taking the house that we looked at before, the one which wasn't insulated at all. If you took that and put wall insulation in it, you put loft insulation in it and you put double glazing in it, where are you losing heat from it then? And you know, there are bits from all the places that we were looking at before, but what becomes really apparent is this huge range of air changes and thermal bridges. And those aren't really something you can do very easily as a single measure, somebody coming in who's relatively untrained in anything other than installing that measure and can just slap it on your house and go away and that's sorted. It, those don't get sorted that way. They're, they're much more complex why those happen. Air changes and thermal bridges, and they become a real problem if you're if you're looking at just those single measures it can start to cause some problems. And to demonstrate what that means, thermal bridges and air changes, we've got a couple of pictures here of, um, of thermal imaging. And the one on the left here of a window, you can see where it's all dark around the edge of the window. And what's happening there, I mean, I think really what's happening in this case, primarily, is that whoever's fitted that window hasn't put in any spray foam insulation, hasn't put in any um, ceiling around the side of that window and so what you've got is a big gap there that lots of cold air is getting through and making it much colder but what you also very commonly get is windows that are installed not in line with the insulation because they're both installed at different times um, and this particularly happens if you're having external or internal solid wall insulation um, so you're cladding the outside of your house or you're uh, you know essentially building a kind of insulated plasterboard on the inside of your walls what you can get there is that the window isn't really in line with that insulation they're not meeting very well and if that happens it's a bit like you've been in lockdown for a while you've maybe eaten a bit too much you've not had quite enough exercise as you normally would have done and you go to put on your you know really warm winter jacket on a very cold winter's day and to go for a walk and, and actually it doesn't quite meet in the middle anymore 
and you've got a big gap down the front uh, where you've not got the jacket there and 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 that's going to be cold it's going to be much colder than if you did have a jacket that was you know fully doing up around you it, it's it, what you're seeing there is an awful lot of heat loss going through a small amount of area because you haven't managed to make the insulation meet you haven't wrapped your house up completely in a blanket you've you've done it slightly and left some gaps and the second bit is it is the air tightness and and again you can see a the picture there with the floorboards and that's you know really that cold patches you know between floorboards that's drafts coming up um and you do need some air exchange in a house but but most houses have more than you need particularly if you build in some um some controlled ventilation into a house you can you can cut down the air exchange from a house very easily without causing um significant problems with damp or mold or stale air or anything like that these things are complicated to tackle in a house they need somebody who understands houses and how they operate um, more than an installer that's coming to just fit loft insulation and that's what they're trained to do and some of the failures that we've had in retrofitting homes in the last um yeah 10 15 years from these sorts of programs and, and from these sorts of approaches are you know a real cautionary tale and there's an example here of some particularly poor external wall insulation on the left hand side um where essentially whoever is installing it who you know they've been asked to come and fit wall insulation not been asked to come and reduce the energy usage of that house or to make that house more environmentally friendly as far as they're concerned they're coming to fit wall insulation and where they've come to a point where there's flues coming out of the side of the house and it's a bit complicated to extend those or to do any work with that they've just left them left a gap there and similarly around the doors where there's kind of some some intricate um plaster work around them it's a bit too complicated to kind of cut the insulation around that so let's just leave that <laughs> and that doesn't work you know what you find is the heat gets out of your house by whichever way it can do and if you don't have a consistent blanket around it um you're not going to get a particularly good result and what you will get and this is where the picture on the right comes in is damp and mold forming because that's where all of you it's the coldest surface in your house and it's where all the hot warm air is going to uh, to condense that's a cautionary tale really about how we've been doing retrofit um but I'm very pleased to say this is an industry that is building and improving very quickly at the moment and part of the reason for that is this um standard that's coming in past 2035 and that really looked at some of the cautionary tales like the one i just highlighted there um it comes out of a review into the, those kind of schemes saying actually what what do we need here and it's really picked out that this isn't just a case of having an individual installer coming in and looking at a house and saying yeah sure i can put that form of insulation on it for you going away and doing that and then say 12 months down the line when you go mm, still still got quite high energy bills maybe i'll have another, another installer coming in and and doing something and that's not the way we should be going with this what's really important here is to have somebody who can have a look at your whole house and go what's the best way of saving energy from here and, and how do i need to make sure that that's specified so it's not going to cause further problems down the line um and so you've got all these roles retrofit assessors retrofit coordinators retrofit designers and evaluators that are helping to build an industry that can consider every home individually and its needs and deliver retrofits that actually do what they need to do those of you i've already seen in the chat who are both really keen who are kind of really keen on doing that retrofit in your own homes a bit early to be accessing this but there are retrofit coordinators out there starting to offer these services um, and that's exactly what we're going to be building in terms of the energy community that role of having somebody at the heart of it who's who's trying to help that help make the right decisions and and help to make sure the installer that's installing products is doing it well so that is the retrofit we need um, I'm going to break a moment for a poll for a moment again and just to understand how much money would you be willing to invest to dramatically reduce the energy efficiency of your home so we're talking about reducing the energy efficiency or not reducing the energy efficiency i've not phrased that very well reducing the energy usage of your home by 50 percent or more how much would you be willing to put in of your own money from that i'm not holding you to it i don't think we're storing the details about who's answered what so so please do answer honestly but don't answer if you're not comfortable with it i've launched a poll
so interesting results really interesting results um certainly you know the more i've been involved in in this area and looking at it the more it's become apparent to me that there are there are lots of people out there who, who are really keen for a solution to this really keen to to understand it and i think this is reflected in the results here so there's a lot of people who are really willing to invest in this i did have an option on here we can only have four options on here so i did have an option which is even more than twenty thousand. so it would be interesting to keep that on there really but um yeah really really useful feedback for us in terms of the service we're trying to build as well and the last poll i'm just going to do is what is the primary reason you want to retrofit your home what's the driver here is it environmental is it for comfort is it a sense of home improvement you you want to feel better about your home you want to make your home you know worth more or is it about bill saving saving money on your energy bills So looks as, as you'd expect, I guess, um, in this kind of a conference, there's a really strong uh, environmental backing for, for the reasons for doing this. Um, and, and somebody was saying kind of bill saving as well. Good. So why is this urgently needed? I'm conscious that a lot of you wanted to know about the solutions more than you wanted to know about the national picture. So I'm gonna move through this um, more swiftly. But just to give a bit of context for a moment, and again, you know, nationally, energy use in buildings is something around the kind of 15% of um, carbon emissions. Um, so it is a significant uh, amount of energy that it takes to, uh, a significant amount of carbon released from the energy use in our buildings. And to give an idea here, you know, this bottom line here is, you know, 15,000 kilowatt hours is what an average UK house uses. A new built house, that's that's something like more like 12,000. Actually, if you bring it down to really kind of lower energy standards, you, you reduce that an awful lot. But all of those are, are still an awful lot of energy use. You compare that to, uh, well, in terms of you try and put a kilowatt hour in context, you know, 1,000 kilowatt hours uh, is equivalent to 303 litres of diesel. I can drive you to Timbuktu in a diesel car. So I think... It's just worth a bit of context to kind of realise how much we are using. You know, it's almost silent. We don't see it, but how much we're using in our homes, how much um, gas we're burning without really seeing it um, in a way that we, we might be more conscious about car use. Um, I hope we were. And, and I should say, I don't say this to say we should be concentrating on, on energy efficiency and not on transport improvement. You know, it's, it's an either or, but, but it's, it's worth just highlighting how much of an important issue this is as well. Yeah, 14%. I, I think I've, I've covered this. But this last point. In 2017, annual temperature adjusted emissions from buildings rose by 1%. And this is a really interesting slide, I think, or really interesting image. Um, I think that that's um, from a report done about 10 years ago. And it was looking at the impact of policies. So the green, you know, the, the reduction here you know this green wedge is from retrofit policies that were in place at that time and if those were continued what that would do in terms of energy bill reduction and then this kind of peach wedge is but how much will we add on by the new houses we're building and at the time you know this was a cautionary tale to say we need to be careful here we need to re really reduce the amount we're adding on with the new houses we're building but we need to do more in the retrofit space and what's unfortunate is it, because what these, what's happening here is these two are balancing each other out, this kind of middle line, and that, that's kind of where we're going to be ending up with this. Um, so the concern here for me is that actually this green wedge is not, you know, even more concern is this isn't where we got to. You know, from that point onwards, the, the amount of expenditure going into retrofit in this country of homes dropped consistently and that, and that industry really um, reduced over time. So... Um, the carbon emissions from housing are continuing to rise. The new bills coming on as part of that, but the biggest part of that story is houses that we've already got. There's an argument here of can we just fit heat pumps and, and technology will be 
you know, will solve us from this. We don't need to work with the, the nitty gritty of trying to, you know, uh, insulate homes and all that kind of expensive work that's disruptive. We can avoid that. I think this slide really speaks to that. Uh, if you look at how that will increase electricity use. So this is, you know, you take this is kind of standard electricity use at the moment. This is what our national grid is dealing with currently. If you put electric vehicles on there as well, you know, without doing anything to reduce the amount number of miles we drive, then then you're looking at a significant increase in the amount of electricity load on the national grid. That's almost not such a problem because you can actually charge vehicles at times when nobody else is using it. But this is a heat pump, and that that heat pump segment, you know, that that's huge. You know, that's a lot more than you know we're currently using being added on again. So you took three three and a half times as much electricity being used by every individual house. If you just fit heat, heat, fit heat pumps and you don't do any of the insulation, that's not something our grid can take. There's enormous reinforcement that would have to happen for that. Um, so, let's take a moment to click through again. So there's a strong environmental reason and it can't be solved just by technology. We do have to retrofit space standards, you know, um, fabric standards of homes. Fuel poverty is another one. And here you see you know, rates of fuel poverty, number of people in fuel poverty increasing as you get down the, the grade. So G rated is a very poorly energy rated home. ABC rated is very highly rated. So you see that really more people in fuel poverty. But the key thing is this fuel poverty gap. That's the difference between the uh, a kind of comfortable position in terms of ability to pay energy bills and uh, and the position people are in and that, and that increases so you're looking at you know the gap between you know the, the residual income that somebody has um, in fuel poverty in the G rated home and being in a comfortable position being you know 1,500 pounds you know it moves up an enormous amount so it's an enormous amount of suffering that we see on a day-to-day -day basis from the, the quality of homes in the city. And there's an economic impact to this. Um, so yeah, 1.4 billion pound cost to the NHS. Um, and at the bottom there, if you look at the cost of what we'll pay for energy between now and 2050, if we if we don't do anything to retrofit homes in Plymouth, 6.6 uh, .6 billion pounds between now and 2050 in energy bills coming out of the city just in Plymouth. And the cost of retrofitting those homes to get a 50% reduction it is about three billion pounds, you know, as a broad estimate. You look at that, and you think this is mad not to do really. Um, and then some of those figures in the middle there, the 43,000. So it doesn't, the point there is it doesn't actually cost that much. This is a really good job creation opportunity. Um, it doesn't cost that much to create each job. Um, in many other fields, it's a lot more than that. And there's a massive macroeconomic benefit for every pound spent on retrofit. A, you know, big economic driver for why we should be supporting this more. So how do we get there? We have to accept that this is a new proposition. This route we've had in the past where, you know, apply and you can get your cavity walls insulated, apply you can get your loft insulated. It's fine, but it it's done a few different things. It's made people kind of dependent on those grants. You know, actually, if I don't get those grants, why would I do that to my home? And and we're not going to be able to provide grants to retrofit every house in, in the country. Um, we're going to have to find some more creative ways of, of getting people to um, invest in that, really. Um, but also, it, it doesn't really fit in terms of, the, you know, it's a different job. It's not somebody turns up for a day. You know, on the right here, here's, here's part of a whole house retrofit that's being done in a house in, in Oxford. Um, by a scheme called Cozy Homes Oxfordshire, which is doing some really good work supporting households there. It, it's really disruptive. <laughs> and and we have to sell that proposition, not um, not the kind of, oh, it'll be really easy to get your home to net zero. You know, actually, there's real advantages to it, reasons why somebody might want to do it, but let's not pretend it's really simple and easy and it's going to be completely free. Um, so we have to accept as a new proposition and, and kind of sell it from there. 
and in, in doing this, I think we've got to view this as a technology adaptation curve. We have got some innovators. We've got people in the country that have, and we've got people in this room who've already invested um, good money in making their homes more efficient. Um, and there's a whole network of people called Super Homes who've done amazing stuff, um, often without any sort of guarantees, often without any sort of, uh, you know, warranty. Um, and, you know, they've been pioneers. And that's really good, but that can't continue. We need, we need you know, we, we need to move on to this early adopters market. And while they're motivated to do this, and I think we've got lots of people in the room here who are in that early adopter market probably, motivated to do this, really want to do it, they do need that certainty. They can't be that kind of pioneering, I'm gonna research how you can apply a cork to my walls and that will make it do it, and, I'll, and then I'll do a kind of DIY job of it. That, that doesn't work um, if we want to expand this. So one of the answers to how do we do this, I think is independent, trusted intermediaries. And, and I'll come back to Cozy Homes Oxfordshire here and a quote that they've got. And I think it really demonstrates it well. Um, I think there's an awful lot of people out there who, who would like to do it, but it is a complex business and there is um, plenty of stories of, of things going wrong or not delivering what they need to. And it needs people to be able to ac access expertise, which is on their side and is completely impartial and will give them really good quality advice. We need better skills. And, and again, some of you, you know, have been asking in chat and, and obviously really keen to do some of this work yourselves and there are companies out there that can do it really well, um, but not many. And most companies, are trained to deliver one particular measure. They're not trained to understand the kind of building physics of retrofit and what might happen if they do that measure in you know, a particular way. Um, and so we need an army of people who are capable of doing that work and understand it better. And we also need more and more of these retrofit coordinators and, that, and that's a bit. So there's a kind of professional services element to this that needs to sit behind it that hasn't existed before, um, but it's become really apparent how, how necessary that is both for people who want to invest in their own property, but even also definitely for people who live in properties where we want to, you know, the government are going to fund it because that person's really vulnerable and, and their, you know, their poor health from the house and they're in is costing the NHS and, and causing misery for them. You know, they also need people to look at this in terms of making sure that it gets the results that we need. And we need, a finance resolution. I don't think for that early adopters market, I don't think we need this for that, but soon afterwards, we really need to be looking more more intelligently at how we finance this work because there's a lot of money in retrofit. The people who are talking about spending 10 to 20,000 pounds, you can easily spend that making a significant um, change to to your home um, and, and more potentially, um, in many cases more. So, Green mortgages, pay-as-you-save loans. Um, pay-as-you-save loans have been trialled by the government before very unsuccessfully, but I still think there might be a room for them at some point. Um, you can also look at kind of leasing deals and and there is energy as service offerings, um, all sorts of ones coming in where you say, well, actually, you know, you're going to pay this much in energy bills in the future. You're going to pay this much in maintenance in the future. Let's just package that in. I'll make a change to your house. And this is an example of one on the right here. Let's just take the money that you are going to spend over the next 30 years and pay it to us instead. And then we'll retrofit your homes with uh, the right equipment to mean that you're going to get all the heat you want, all the electricity you want, but with almost no, you know, no carbon emissions, almost no impact on the national grid um, because of the technologies we've fitted. And we'll, we'll obviously be getting a return from that investment. There is models like that happening already. There's one particular one called Energy Sprong, which is really strong and, and really expanding and, and delivers a whole house retrofit to net zero, um, particularly focused on the social housing sector. That really needs to improve. So, um, last two quick sections. Um, how are Plymouth Energy Community driving this change? We're currently in the middle of, and I'm very busy with at the moment a fuel poverty scheme in the city we are seeking to retrofit 300 homes 
if I'm honest, we won't get there. It's complicated to do this. Um, that was always an ambitious target. Um, and we rather do it well than do it <laughs> quickly. Um, but a significant investment. There, there will be, you know, certainly more than a million pounds spent in retrofitting homes in Plymouth. Um, and there's more rounds of this to come along the way. And we've been really keen to be an early adopter of this system of saying we don't just want one contractor doing individual measures. We want to be able to go into a house, speak to that customer individually, you know, as a, as a kind of impartial service and say, what's going to be the best way to spend grant money? What's the best way to spend £10,000 on this house? Um, and then to work with local installers, not work with national, very large installers, but local installers to make sure that happens. Um, and that's the work we've been doing. Um, been keeping us extremely busy over the last six months or so um, and that has brought in retrofit coordinator services into our team um, and an awful lot more knowledge um, and I'm very proud of the job we've done there in supporting vulnerable customers and, and this is a way of working we want to continue um, we think it is really important to have an independent organization with some expertise sitting on the customer side going through all of these schemes and and that needs to be expanded um, to those households who are you know, willing and able to, to pay for the advice that they need um, with impartial in-depth home assessments. Um, we've looked at a few models for how to provide that and we need to kind of train up internally. We need to finish delivering that fuel poverty project. So we've got some capacity, um, but we've already done quite a lot of work in this space to, to get ourselves ready for this. Um, and I believe households need, as well as that assessment, the, the kind of support along the way, specifying, procuring and, and overseeing works. And I do, in terms of the people who are here, um, those no regret measures. Um, you, you should regret not having done them yet. Um, they should be a really high priority. Air tightness is, is really important and there are things you can do there. Um, to cut that just from the draft briefing I mentioned before. You can go further than that, you know, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of value in spending some time, maybe on a slightly colder day in the autumn, um, with a where where it's windy, with a, a little smoke pen that you you know you can get and just to give a little bit of smoke and some sealant and just kind of going around all sorts of areas of your house where you'll see there's loads of air just coming through um and you know bath panels are really key anywhere where you've got pipe work um and services going through the wall um but really trying to tackle that really important um better understanding your energy usage there is all sorts of monitors that you can buy they're not hugely expensive but they help you to understand how particularly electricity is being used but um, you can get ones that monitor temperature and that sort of thing and can pick up on where you might be overheating your house in some areas and then planning for retrofit so if you're looking at home renovations repairs or extensions in the next few years it's a really good time to build in a bit of time before that to work out actually what can I do to really uh, you know alongside that work you've already got disruptive work going on you've already got um, lots of work going on in the house and some of the trades that you might need to do some some good um, energy retrofit coming into the house how can I expand on that extension and uh, do some work to make my house more comfortable more environmentally friendly all of those sorts of things um, boiler replacements another example you've got boiler replace you know you, you know you're going to need to replace your boiler in the next few years it's worth starting to think about a heat pump it's worth thinking about how you could replace that boiler with a heat pump looking at the funding available work out whether you can stretch to that and if it makes sense for you and their clear advice for um, people retrofitting your home I will put my um, email address in here and I might be able to direct you people here to, to people who can provide that advice. Um, but it isn't a mature industry yet. It will grow a lot in the next year, but there isn't a, an industry of people who are specialists at providing advice for retrofitting your home. We're trying to be part of that industry um, at PEC and we will be launching that. Um, but it's not there currently, unless you want to go to an architect who's particularly good in this area and, and really invest a lot of money in, in, in a project. Um, but even then, a lot of architects don't necessarily have the expertise in this area. Um, retrofit coordinators are key. It's a new professional qualification and it's worth having a retrofit coordinator involved in a retrofit of your home. So anything where you are looking to have a significant impact in your home, where you are looking at some of those measures I mentioned earlier that are a bit more risky or worth thinking about. 
materials is important, particularly if you've got an older home. Older homes, so what I mean there is anything before 1920s tended to be built with lime mortar, lime render, and they were built to not be completely waterproof frankly the walls would soak in water they'd get wet sometimes of the year they dry off very quickly the lime mortar and lime render breathes very easily or allows moisture to come in and out of it there's a danger with those kind of walls that if you start fitting um, plastic insulation on the outside or on the inside that you're blocking off the ability for them to breathe it's not always a disaster it can work fine sometimes but it is a higher risk and there are it's worth understanding that and it's worth understanding some of the risks in your house about actually, might this result in some damp later down the line have i got any rising damp coming through uh, have i got enough ventilation in there there are slightly more expensive materials but that work much better wood fiber being one cork is another one um, and there are all sorts of kind of plasters and renders that involve um, lime and cork and, and those sorts of products that can insulate really well but do allow your wall to breathe as it used to, I don't always like the term breathe, but do allow it to, to get slightly wetter and drier and to, to do all that without becoming mouldy or damp or anything like that. Um, and that can be really important. And the last bit is, is finding a contractor that you trust and, and has some training in the principles of retrofit. And I think, yeah, as I've been saying, we're, we're working as hard as we can to make sure that there are more of those contractors available. Um, but if I'm honest, I don't know that I can put directly towards too many of those, depending on what measures you're looking at. You know, that they are few and far between. Um, and this is an industry that really needs to be built. Um, and that's really where the importance of having, I believe, somebody like Plymouth Energy Community trying to play that role on one hand of giving the trusted advice, whilst also um, working with that industry, working with those installers and saying, look, you need to know more about this to do this work. And we can get you the training to do that. We can make sure you do that. And if you do that training, we can give you that work because we've got all these people who want to do it on their home. Um, I think that gives us a, a status of, of where we are. I haven't gone into lots of detail there about um, particular questions around retrofitting homes. And I'm conscious we've got a few minutes left at the end. I don't know if we want to pick up some of these or Paul, I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Thanks ever so much, Justin. I think that was a fascinating and, and really informative workshop. So thanks ever so much for that. I wonder if we, um, should we just go through a number of the questions that have, have popped up? And what I'll try and do is I'll, I'll try and go through as many as possible. Should we, should we just try and do and see if we can uh, um, kind of rush through so if you could, if you give sort of short quick answers then that would be great and because there's a whole host of them here so um nick cape has asked i am trying to retrofit my house and i'm getting a lot of conflicting advice from different professionals and you've kind of covered this but who can i trust um hi, so yeah that's a different one at the moment and i think you know from my perspective that's something that needs to change in the industry um i think in general I would be looking, if you're, if you're looking at an in-depth retrofit, I'd be looking at a professional who has done some work on your house using a program like PHPP, which is a passive house design software. Um, you get in a much more detailed look at a home from, from that kind of, so whoever it is, um, if you've, depending on what you're trying to invest, because actually getting somebody to model your home in PHPP or to do some work like that is expensive. Um, but if you're really looking for, for kind of, you know, the best answers, that, that's the way to go from it. I think what we're lacking at the moment is a lower level than that. You know, somebody who's kind of coming, frankly, a bit cheaper, but can still provide really good advice um, that, that maybe isn't modeling things in PHPP for you, but um, is is doing a good job of giving you advice. Um, uh, retrofit coordinator, look for a retrofit coordinator. Brilliant, that's great, thanks. Um, so there's an anonymous question. Why is underfloor loss never included? I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I think if you, in terms of why do we never do anything about loss underneath the floor of a house, um, it's, a, it's a very disruptive measure. And because you don't lose as much heat from it, you don't tend to save as much money. And so for a lot of the ways that schemes are targeted at the moment, it's often about money saving or energy saving. Um, and so it's often more expensive. It is starting to happen. We're doing quite a bit of that kind of work on the scheme we're delivering in Plymouth, quite a lot of underfloor insulation in. Um, 
but to actually do it properly it is quite disruptive and it's quite tricky in a suspended timber floor it can be even more so on a solid floor it can be quite difficult brilliant i think that's that's a that's a perfect answer so we've got a question here about new builds from nile hockey do you think good bream standards should be legally enforced on all new builds whether it's bream or not there's all sorts of different standards involved in it um i think we were ready to move to a much higher standard of new build in most house builders were ready to move to that in 2016 um and the standards that were being brought in then and i think it's a absolute tragedy that those were abandoned at that point i think um and it's locked in so much carbon emissions that we needn't have done the industry was ready for it um and actually made a lot of distrust in that industry about investing in building up to those standards again because you know you don't want to you know a lot of people don't want to be the person who goes first and then ends up building more expensive houses when everybody else is building for cheaper um so but yes in the answer yeah we we have to make our homes zero carbon the ones that we're building as soon as possible really you should be having as the seat pumps in there you should be having very high fabric standards and and more you know um actually the data on how much extra it costs when you start to do it across the whole industry it isn't all that much absolutely yeah no that's great um just to try and squeeze in another another question not anonymous question why is there only one government approved installer in plymouth part of the green home grant scheme uh, if I answer that honestly, I think I'd say that the Green Homes Grant Scheme was launched two months after it was announced <laughs> and closed six months after it was launched. And it takes time in this industry and there's a lot of distrust in the industry um, from, from, in, you know, from builders, from people that might be doing this kind of work that actually the government will announce the programme, you'll get the right accreditation for it, and then it'll be abandoned six months down the line, and you'll have wasted a whole load of money, you won't have got much work out of it, you'll have had to work all hours of the day to try and make it happen, because it would have been really complicated. We don't invest long-term in retrofit in this country. Um, and you know the scheme we're delivering at the moment was due to end in March, um, and we barely managed to get ourselves together to be starting to, you know, get to a place where we could install homes by March. You know, we'd had about four months to set up and it just wasn't anything like enough for a complex program. Um, luckily, it was extended. But, it, you know, these things need to be, you know, wh when money's invested or, or when something is set up, it needs to have a much longer time period um, than the Green Homes Grant did um, in order to actually get a, a good industry that set itself up rather than a few companies that have run at, run at a challenge but maybe weren't quite prepared for it. Brilliant. Thanks, Justin. I'm afraid we've we've run out of time. Um, but Justin, please do go back into the home screen and you can see the, the amount of questions that you've generated and, and the kind of discussion. Um, thanks ever so much for a really fascinating, informative workshop. Um, we've tried to set up um, the, 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 the forum um, one of the aims is about um, action, and you've given us a whole host of different actions that we can take ourselves to reduce our own carbon footprint. So thanks ever so much for that. Um, just to let you know, everyone, that the next um, session is going to start immediately after this, uh, which is why we have to finish absolutely on time. And that's going to be uh, Matt winning, um, um, doing a talk. Matt is... Um, uh, a climate economist by day and a, a comedian by night. And I've seen Matt speak and he's a, a brilliant um, uh, speaker. So please do go along to the next session now. But if um, if you could um, have a round of applause, please, for Justin and, and his fantastic workshop now, that would be absolutely brilliant. OK, and Justin, you can see the claps up there carrying on in the corner there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for that, Justin. And, and thanks, everyone. And, and see you in the next session.